University of Cambridge Museums and welcome to the first Museum Remix Q&A session. If you'd like to find out more about the Museum Remix project, uh, please head over to the UCM website, there'll be a link on the channel and check out the full details there. We're still in the midst of our first challenge, so there is plenty of time to get into, um, into the project. Uh, I'm speaking today to two of my colleagues from the UCM, Helen Ritchie from the Fitzwilliam Museum and Liz Hyde from the Sedgwick Museum about objects that they've submitted to the remix. If you've got any questions for them, please pop them into the chat and the UCM wizards will feed them back and I can ask Liz and Helen. I will start with the basics um, and I suppose because of the order you've got on my screen, Liz first and then Helen. Who are you and what do you do for the museums? Um, I'm Liz Hyde. I'm the director of the Sedgwick Museum, which if you don't know the Sedgwick Museum, it's the University Museum of uh, geology, Earth Sciences. Um, so normally what I do is run a museum, but obviously here we are, you know, at home, trying to run it remotely. And I'm Helen Ritchie, and I'm a curator in the Department of Applied Arts at the Fitzwilliam Museum, so Applied Arts, or maybe some people say Decorative Arts. And I um, mostly look after um, the objects that date from 1800 to the present day, so the kind of the And why did you want to be involved in Remix? Um, I think it's a fantastic um, pro program and project and I've been involved with it in the past. Um, and I just thought it was a great opportunity to be doing it. The way we're doing it this year is, is a bit different um, and all the online components are really interesting. So I thought it would be great to, to enter it again. Hmm. Yeah, I'd agree with Helen. I think it's a great opportunity and I think with all our museum collections, I mean, particularly for me in the Sedgwick, where people often think of it as a science collection, I'm really interested in sort of helping people to understand and, and hearing about that there are, of course, really loads of different ways to look at the collections. Um, and, you know, and lots of people have really interesting takes on them. So that's- That too, for me, is one of my favourite things about Remix is that we are bringing in the science and the arts and history collections and presenting it all, because it, it's all part of uh, what we do as museums. Yeah. Um, the big question, I guess, is why have you chosen the object you've chosen for Museum Remix Unheard? And whoever wants to kick that off, feel free. Um, I'm, ha I'm happy to go first. So I've chosen this photograph, um, which is sort of been hanging around in our museum displays. For, I mean, all the time I've been associated with museums for years. Um, uh, and, and sort of several people have pointed it out to me. So it's this photograph of these three guys um, at the point where they are collecting a fossil rhino from Barrington Pit, which those of you local to Cambridge, it's about, you know, it's sort of seven or eight miles south of Cambridge. Um, and I chose it because, well, there's so much going on in it. Um, it's, you know, is it a posed photograph? These three guys, you know, they've clearly got their different roles. And, and what's quite unusual, and also another reason to choose it, is that we know their names, um, so we can find out a little bit about them. Um, so we've got these glimpses. Um, of what's going on. Is it posed? What's going on? You know, did they all sort of, you know, is that really how they worked? It seems unlikely. Um, but I also, what I was really nice is that this remix is about making audio. And I think, I look at that picture and what's missing is those conversations that those guys were having and the conversations that were going on around them. And that's, for me, that's a, that's a really powerful thing. I'd really like to know what was happening there or what were they talking about? What did they talk about when they got home at the end of the day? And I chose um, our huge um, marble bust of <laughs> Victoria. It's so oversized uh, in the flesh. It's really, really enormous. And it's, it's quite a new acquisition. The museum only acquired it a couple of years ago. And we made quite a big public announcement when we, because it was saved for the nation. It was export stopped. It was supposed to be leaving the country and going to America. And um, so there's a huge kind of publicity um, around it. It's a huge bust itself. It's very, very prominent in the space. But because it depicts Queen Victoria and a monarch, I feel like sometimes those kinds of objects are actually quite invisible, weirdly, because I feel people, people see images of, mon of monarchs so frequently that it's actually quite easy not to really look anymore at, at objects that depict them because we're so used to seeing them everywhere. Um, What's so interesting with this bust is that, you know, it's, it's, it is sort of easy to walk past it when you just think, oh yeah, that's Queen Victoria. But there's actually a lot going on in terms of 
who who made it, why it was made, where it was positioned, and of course, you know, what's in, of interest to us, especially now, I think, what does she represent? What mm -hmm. story can we tell with the object? So there's an awful lot going on um, around kind of this this one um, object, which in some ways I think is quite is is easy to walk past sometimes. Exactly, that's how I feel about it. I don't think I thought anywhere nearly as much about that bust until recently, until you, you started showing off for the remix. And um, I guess in light of the recent events across the world um, in relation to statues and public monuments, it's quite timely to have included a statue of Queen Victoria and the, the symbol of empire that she is. Um, you know, should the museum, and I guess this is for Helen chiefly, should the museum's approach to Queen Victoria object and, and should it change? Do you have any opinions on, on what we should be doing, what the stories we should be telling and highlighting in the museum are with, with Victoria? Well, I think museums are, are not, we're not in a vacuum and we have to engage with what's going on in contemporary society. Um, so I think it is, it, it is important to look at what's going on um, in the wider world and to think about how that affects us in the museum. But um, as I said in my kind of uh, my video clip, um, when statues are in public places, they are very much celebratory of the people that they represent. But in museums, we have a, a different kind of opportunity to talk more widely kind of about them and, and situate the people they represent and think about, as you say, the stories we can tell um, and, how, and how best to contextualise them. So I think it's interesting with Queen Victoria because historically we would have focused on as a queen, and historically, and it is of course still interesting, but it's by the bust itself by a very famous artist. So perhaps in the past we would have focused on the, the artist who made it. Um, but I think right now the more timely stories around Queen Victoria are exactly that about her symbol of empire. Um, how does that sit um, uh, with the rest of the collection? How does that sit with the, the visitors who come in? What do they want to know? Do they want to know more about empire? In my experience um, from an exhibition we did a couple of years ago, uh, because empire is not widely taught on the on the curriculum, a lot of people want to know more information about it, and, and maybe Queen Victoria is is a way into that for some people. Thank you. I mean, Liz, I don't know if you have any comments on it. I know it was about Helen's object, but I'm sure you have thoughts. No, I, I really I didn't know much about. I mean, just to echo what you're saying. I didn't know much about the statue, and it is precisely the sort of thing I'd have walked past or sort of thought it lived on the bar in the Queen Vic. Um, <laughs> dare I say it. Um, but it, it does make us think a lot about, you know, it, I think you, you made us think a lot about what that means. And I think, in, I mean, I think the picture that I've chosen is a different thing, but it also, it, it almost characters, caricatures class. You know, there's these three guys and it's saying something about class. And, you know, was that in their minds when they posed that photograph? Um, you know, were they trying to celebrate something about the people that were involved in this? Was it a sort of, you know, what might be quite a clumsy way of doing that? Or, you know, was that in their minds? Um, what, what was going on? I think that's, it's quite interesting to sort of, that there are parallels now. You know, these threads come right through 100, 120 years later. Um, that they're still really relevant. And those sort of museum objects, either photograph or the statue, they, 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 they echo with us now. I suppose that's all preempted uh, what I had as another question. Um, no, 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 <laughs> that's a good thing. Um, but I mean, I, I don't know if it will sort of make you answer or say anything else. But I've got, even though the objects are so different, um, because they come from the same sort of time period, do you think there are any sort of common themes or threads that you could pick up on between them? I know that's not a sort of big question. Well, well, it struck me that what's interesting maybe is about the idea of, which Liz just mentioned about them being about them being posed. Mm -hmm. The photograph is very much, as you say in your video, is a posed photograph. This is not a kind of action shot. You know, it's been yeah. carefully constructed. And again, the the image of Queen Victoria is, um, although it's quite emotive, but it is also posed uh, and it's based on very carefully staged photographs of Queen Victoria that were taken for her Golden Jubilee. So there's there's an element of very careful construction, what you want people to see, I think, going on in, in both objects. Yeah, and I would say that in my photograph, it's what did they want people to see? I mean, I sort of look rather wryly at the man from the museum is the guy that's sort of standing over the fossil, sort of very proprietorially saying that, like, we're having that in our museum, thank you very much. 
um, whereas the sort of clearly the work when Arthur Hardman is just sort of, you know, he's just, well, he's just like, oh, come on, just get on with it, you know, um, sort of, I think it's that, it, you know, in a way is that taking that photograph, it's claiming it for the museum um, and, uh, and sort of, you know, recording that moment where it becomes something from, a, you know, a bit of something, a bit of bone in the ground becoming a museum object. Um, you know, at the point now that we can take it, we can put a label on it, we can document it and put it on display, it's ours. Right, and I think that's the, the most fascinating thing. It's, it's quite interesting to look at who has the power of telling the story, who has the power of actually presenting that narrative. Um, mm. Mm -hmm. These objects really pick up in really beautiful ways. I mean, for me, it's what's very interesting is that in that photograph, we know, sorry, we, it's a bit of a delay there. Um, in our photograph, we know who those people are and we know who the workman is, which is really unusual. And I've had a really interesting time rummaging around in the census records and finding out more about him um, and where he lived on Barrington High Street and how many children he had and how, you know, as, um, we sort of see him through the census records. And then about 15, 20 years later, his wife died and he's become a publican. So he's obviously sort of no longer... Um, you know, young and fit enough to be digging holes in the cement works at, at the, um, actually it was cement works, it was actually a cop work working for him. Um, um, so that's, yeah, that, there's a whole connection there that's been really, really interesting just because we have his name and otherwise we'd never find that. Um, that's wonderful. Now, what would you like to see Remixes doing with these objects? Ooh. You know, it doesn't have to be about this task, of course, you know, <laughs> this is a project that's going to go on for a while. We're going to set other challenges, other tasks. Um, and what we'd like is for every object that we to um, create videos for to be used across all of them. So sky's the limit, really. Well, I think it'll be fascinating to hear different um, perspectives on objects. I mean, I think that's that is the, the joy of Museum Remix is to hear as many different people's take uh, their takes on, on all of the objects as possible, because no matter how often or how much we in museums try and think around objects, you know, and you try and approach them from different um, directions, uh, we can only do so much. And, and, and every single person as an individual is bringing a particular viewpoint. And you really need lots and lots of individuals to bring lots of different viewpoints to really try and get a kind of 360 um, degree view on, on an object, I think. I want loads of people involved. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I think having those huge range of viewpoints is really helpful. And I think having lots of people's views is also, you know, we are research institutions. We want to study these objects, you know, and I'm sure Helen feel the same. And, and I, it genuinely is helpful to have other perspectives to make us think differently about what avenues we might want to research and what, how we might want to present them in our gallery um, to people. Um, so actually it's sort of, it, you know, not only is it making us think differently, but it's stimulating whole new areas of research. And I think that's that's a real benefit of this. So, yeah, I mean, I'm really excited about what might come out of this. Um, as I say, I, you know, I think this, this particular picture for us, for the Cedric, lends itself quite well to audio. Um, but, you know, um, other, you know, objects that we're going to be talking about later in, this, in the series about we've got some diamonds which were mined under quite challenging conditions. We've got a, a dinosaur who was given to us by somebody with some really dodgy connections. Um, I really like that um, people can bring their different perspectives and perhaps challenge us in our sort of perhaps complacency around what we think these things are all about. Yeah. That openness is, is what I really like about mm -hmm. it. Um, mm -hmm. I have a question that's come in from YouTube, I believe. Um, has another remix object caught your eye out of the objects that we've had for, um, for submitted to remix from the museums? Is there anything that has jumped out with you that's particularly fascinating? Um, I loved the, um, I'm going to get it wrong now, uh, the, the, this sort of plate from uh, MAA, which I think was <laughs> about um it had was it was it braille on it or was it is that right or was it it but it was it was a sign language isn't it sign language it's sign language, sign language, sign language on it. i was just thinking the same thing yeah, <laughs> yeah that that was um, i mean i i love um ceramics and it's a big part of my day-to-day -day job so that caught my eye straight away but it, i just think that's a really really 
wonderful object and completely kind of um, opens up lots of different conversations to have um, and about kind of the history of it and what it means to people now. And I, yeah, I just thought that that object was completely fantastic. And I, I, I had no idea it was in MAA's collection. And this is the other joy of Remix, of course, is because there are so many objects in Cambridge and so many different kind of museums and you just can't always know exactly what everyone else has got. So it's been wonderful kind of seeing some of the treasures being pulled out. Absolutely. I agree. And I was I was going to suggest also that plate because it's sort of it's got an interesting history and it seemed to. Um, and the other one, and I'm sort of I feel like I'm not quite remembering the details, but I know the Polar Museum put forward a typewriter that rather stuck in my mind. Um, and it's because it was a woman, it belonged to a woman who traveled. It was quite unusual for her to travel. And I I really liked the idea of what, what had been written on that typewriter. Um, and, and perhaps what it meant, you know, in the way that, you know, when you've got a rather fancy new laptop and you carry it around and you feel quite proud, how one of those typewriters in, I don't know, 1930s in, in, in the Arctic, I think, would have been quite a cool thing. Um, so, yeah, that's, I'm afraid I'm not quite remembering the details correctly, but that, that was something that sort of stood out for me. Yes, it was um, Phyllis Wager, I believe, um, is how you pronounce it. Portable typewriter because I mean I, I've carried a typewriter around that's not that's never easy portable or not <laughs> <laughs> I do have another question and um, this is for Liz about the um, quarry photo is why if you know why do we have the name of this quarryman in this instance when it'd be usually admitted I wish I knew and I think it, I've had a long conversations with our archivist about that because we have it it's on a typewritten strip of paper under the mounted version of this photo um, and she and I have talked about when we go back into the museum whether we should demount them de de it's a framed photograph demount it and have a look inside because we genuinely don't know how how that typewritten caption has come through it you know the type the caption is clearly younger than 1901 when the photo was 1900 when the photograph was taken so it, it's a, yeah, it's a complete mystery to me, and perhaps there's also an interesting remix story there. Is why why was that? You know, how did that piece of information stay? You know, did that maintained? So I'm not going to answer that, right? No, I I, I find that as uh, just as fascinating. Um, mm -hmm. with with posing and controlling the narrative is why those little decisions were made. Who who actually does get the little line yeah. line? It's it's all interesting story of, of people. Uh, at the I end. agree. Yeah, and you see, I think you know, did that man ever come into the museum? You know, when you live in Barrington in the turn of the century, did you ever come into Cambridge very much? You know, yeah, you know, he would he have been welcome in the museum? Would he felt have well felt welcome in the museum? I don't know. And so I, you know, did he ever come back and see it once it went on display? Because this was. So this is 1900. The museum itself opened in 1904. So there would have been part of the sort of, you know, opening displays. Did he ever come and see it? Don't know. You know. Okay. Uh, I can see somebody's typing. So I'm going to hold off on a question. Um, but I'll ask you one of mine, which is a big overall. Um, so answer as you will. Obviously, museum storytelling is fascinating to all of us. Is there anything outside Remix just that you'd like to see museums do in terms of telling their stories? Any sort of new way in to our collections? So in terms of maybe, um, I don't know, a, a new way of bringing in audiences or presenting digital information or anything like that? Gosh, lockdown has made us think all about that a lot, hasn't it? Um, <laughs> you know, and if you'd asked me that six months ago, I'd have said something different because, you know, in a lot, in a way, lockdown has made us think really a lot about how we, you know, what it is we can do to bring objects to people and to bring their stories alive when we haven't got a museum to, to invite them into. And, and I suppose it makes me think much more about you know, when we interpret things digitally, it's not just about saying to people, here's some information about this object, but really you should come and see it. Um, it's actually it's like, well, what can we share with you now? And what can you share with us um, about that? You know, what you know about it or what you feel about it. And how can we capture that 
um, digitally, but also then actually when you come back in the museum, how can we, you know, that, that, that rhino skull sitting in the gallery with nothing, you know, nothing to say that there's a whole remix going on about it at the moment. Yeah. Um, you know, so how, what can we do to sort of say, actually, lots of people have been thinking about this in a really different way. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't know. We're thinking a lot about what digital means right now, aren't we? Yes, I, I, um, for those who don't know, I work in the digital team. So it's obviously something that's very much on my mind is, is how we can create an equity of experience from within physical spaces yeah. to a, an online, increasingly virtual world. Um, Helen, sorry, did you? No, I was just going to say exactly the same, but I think it's, it's interesting how we, thinking about how we capture all of this amazing information, all of these amazing takes on these objects, because as, um, when you when you work in and all of the objects are on a big database and the, the database hut you can put in the information you want to about the object and and historically you know we've we've put in sort of facts or what we think are facts but of course that some of that is actually interpretation and, and you might a, a cut or kind of you know like a label uh, about the object into the into the database but I think more and more when we're getting all of these amazing different um, approaches and interpretations, it's kind of how do you record all of that information, kind of A, for kind of posterity and to have it, but also then, as you say, how do we present it both digitally and in the physical space without having kind of 17 labels around an object, uh, which is kind of too much for people to take in? How do we, as Liz says, when people walk into the museum, how do they know that this object has been remixed? How are we going to tell people that? How, what's the, where's the information going to go? I did a workshop recently and someone was saying about kind of, it'd be interesting to kind of catalog um, uh, objects as if it was kind of for a zine or kind of for a particular thematic approach. And how that, oh, cool. you know, you, you, you need to kind of retain the original kind of the factual information about the object somewhere, but then the interpretation could be kind of shifted around more than it is currently, maybe. Sorry, I muted there for a yelling cat reason, but those were absolutely fascinating <laughs> answers. Thank you so much. Mm. We've had a, think, a couple I mean, more. To add to that, I just add, I think, okay. I think in the Sedgwick, we're thinking a lot about how we, how the stories that we tell aren't just the same old stories of the dead white men. Mm. And you know, we're very lucky we've got a community cabinet that my colleague Rob Theodore um, runs with, which we display objects that are not from our collections, that they are from people, the members of the public's collections. And that's a way in which we're trying to get those voices in. And I suppose for me, Remix is about thinking about, well, how can we sort of extend that into the gallery? How can we sort of share in our, you know, in our displays? This is what we think about it, but actually this is what you think about it. Mm -hmm. I've got a good question from Twitter now. Um, this is for you, Helen. Um, did Queen Victoria have approval of her images and would she have liked this one? <laughs> no, she'd have hated this one. <laughs> didn't see this one. Um, uh, I think I mentioned in the video clip that she didn't sit for Gilbert because I think people think because he's quite a well-known artist, she must have kind of been sitting for him, but she didn't. She didn't know anything about this object being made. Um, so she, um, it was, it was done from, it's interesting because it was partly done from these photographs that were commissioned for her Golden Jubilee. Um, but those photographs themselves are often um, very, very touched up. It's a very early form of kind of altering photographs. So she actually looks kind of quite smooth and um, kind of younger in the photographs themselves. So it's interesting that Gilbert has sort of slightly taken it on himself to, to make her look more realistic um, than she actually did in the photographs. But I, I don't think she'd have been very pleased about Gilbert's um, image because I'm sure she probably did have a say over the official Golden Jubilee photographs, um, but not over kind of all of the other, the other imagery of her. And she appears, of course, in a lot in things like Punch, you know, in cartoons. So, I mean, people, her image was used quite widely in different ways and, and ridiculed quite a lot. But I, I don't think she'd have been very pleased with this particular. And I think also the, there's some hints from, from, from meeting minutes that the Army and Navy Club who commissioned the bust was slightly surprised at the kind of hyper-realism of um, <laughs> this depiction of her too. That's brilliant. There are no other It's quite refreshing, isn't it, to see mm -hmm. any woman 
I mean, not just a queen, but any woman not in that sort of perfect, um, sort of smooth skin, skin beauty. It's quite unusual. Yeah, I mean, it, and it is, it's amazing. It shows the skill of his carving that he's managed to, to do the, the soft, dimpled chins as well as he has done. I mean, it is, it's incredible carving, but it, it's a real attention to detail and it's very, very kind of realistic, and very lifelike. Mm -hmm. It's quite moving in a way. So it's all mm. quite vulnerable. Yeah, and she does look, she does look very, very um, sort of sad as a bust, but of course that's, that was also the public um, perception of Queen Victoria at this time because she had been in mourning since 1861 and hadn't really come out of it until her Golden Jubilee, which is sort of over 20 years later. So, I mean, she was very much sort of fixed in people's minds as quite a kind of sad figure by, by this late point in her life. This um, touches on something you said earlier, um, Helen, about how we treat monarch images um, in our day to day. Um, do you have a sense of what visitors' responses to Queen Victoria have been or are? Um, no, not particularly Queen Victoria, because as I say, we don't get, um, I, I think people often, you know, they just see kings and queens as kings and queens and of course there are lots of monarchs depicted around the museum around the Fitzwilliam Museum you will come across lots of different whether that's uh, paintings um, or uh, monarchs depicted on ceramics or busts and sculpture so there's lots of different ways you can encounter them but I think um, people are sometimes uh, will be more taken aback when we start to maybe rethink about these objects in different ways as I, as I said near the beginning because um, I know for in the past when we sort of um, shown, actually it was kind of busts, smaller busts of, of quite well-known figures. And we tried to sort of say a bit more about some of the less palatable aspects of their histories. Some, some visitors were a little bit resistant to that because they're not used to that kind of interpretation in the museum up until now, you know, historically that is not in this, um, very present in the museum. But I think going forwards, we're much more we're very keen to have a much more sort of rounded and balanced view on people, both good and bad. So I think we'll be more of that in the future, I hope. Fingers crossed. Thank you. Um, hang on, just looking at through this list of questions. Uh, another question for Liz. Are photos like the Barrington Quarry one typical? And was it usual, usual for excavation teams to take pictures like this? This particular one, we've actually got a whole set of photos, not particularly from that excavation, sorry. Um, there are a whole set of later ones, which are clearly sort of a professional photographer's come in and taken them. Um, and I, I don't know, I think it's quite unusual, actually. I think, um, and I think what's particularly unusual is that we have a workman in this picture, because most of the other pictures are the sort of university people sort of standing around looking, pointing importantly. Um, interesting things in the cliff rather than sort of looking like they've been actually grubbing around in the dirt. Um, so there are, I mean, our, our archivist would be able to answer more fully, but I think we do have quite a lot of um, photographs from this time. There were lots of interesting things coming out of these, these, these quarries all across Cambridge at the time. There's a, there a sort of uh, coprolite workings was a sort of, well, it's sort of Cambridgeshire's own gold rush, but it's not gold, it's fossilised poo. Um, so a bit less glamorous, um, but it was actually their phosphate nodules. Um, not most of them actually not food, but it was called coprolites. Um, uh, and they were they were being quarried for fertilizers. You treat them with sulfuric acid, and they make phosphate fertilizer. And that's a sort of first um, artificial fertilizer. And so that's sort of you know that turn of the century, real sort of like needing to sort of increase um, uh, food production. Um, so. There was lots of excavations going on, and I think at the same time there was concomitantly lots of excitement from the from the geologists saying, "Gosh, look at all the things that are coming out with these, out of these quarries." Um, and as I say, this is around the time that they were building Sedgwick Museum, so presumably McKenney Hughes, Thomas McKenney Hughes, who was the, the, the board warden for the museum's professor at the time, was sort of having a little look out for sort of, "Oh, yes, there's some nice goodies to put in our museum here." Um, and indeed, if you know the Sedgwick, we've got a composite hippo skeleton. And it's composite because it's put together from the bones of lots of different individuals from this same locality that have been collected over sort of 10 years. So there was quite a lot of interest and excitement around that. So I think the photography of that site was quite, you know, was quite common. Others less so. 
and, and you know ones that include working class people almost none I wonder if you could just um, to add to that just uh, people might not know about uh, museums and photography, photographic archives um, so much obviously in terms of what people think of museums I wonder if you could just um, tell us a little bit about the Cedric and the photo archives and so on so we're very lucky in Cedric is that we have a professional archivist, Sandra Freshney, who looks after our vast archive of material. Um, and because geology is a sort of a field science and a recording science, we have records of field trips, you know, back, I mean, at least into the 30s. And, and we have Adam Cedric, who is the Victorian, you know, whose who museum is named after. We have field notebooks um, from the 1840s, 1850s, we have field records. Um, so we have these huge amounts of records, but what we also have is the more informal records too, which are just this amazing, fascinating sort of resource. I mean, if any of you are on Twitter, to follow Sedge Archivist, Sandra, she's got a fantastic sort of steady stream of amazing pictures that she produces, you know, she digs out from the archive. So some of them are formal field photographs, people recording what they were seeing as part of their, 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 their sort of research. But then there are pictures of people having a laugh on field trips. Um, and there's some fantastic ones back to the sort of 1890s and earlier um, of students, including some really cool pioneering women in their long dresses and their straw hat with their geological hammers, um, doing their field stuff, you know, out in, in, in the hills in the Lake District um, in Wales, um, learning about geology and discovering it. So those photographic records are incredibly important and we're only just beginning to sort of really see the potential of them. I mean, I think Sandra quite rightly feels she's got her, you know, her work is, is huge. Um, but, you know, it, almost everything she finds is fascinating to me. And I think it's a way of filling out some of the stories and looking again. You know, we've recently found what we think is the first record of a black man on a field trip in 1901. Um, and we're really interested to try and find out who he is, um, because, you know, that's a sort of very rare at that time and, and it'd be really we'd like to help be able to tell that story too um, as I say there's lots of these fascinating pictures of these um these early women geologists um not just some of them were the, some of the wives and the professors but some of them were independent women who studied on their own and became you know became quite important figures um and you know and there was quite a lot of I think camaraderie on these on these field trips so yeah there's there's a there's a huge resource um, to be mined and we're you know we're always keen to hear from people who are interested in studying them and having a nose around and being able to tell us more about it. It's terrifically exciting um, yeah. and your comment about the women actually segues really nicely into another question from Twitter um, that we've got for Helen about Queen Victoria. Um, mm -mm. Do we know whether any women would have been allowed into the space where Queen Victoria's bust was displayed, or was it a men-only space? There is something interesting in the power dynamic there. A very good question. So the for the Army and Navy Club, which is a private members club in central London for members of the armed forces, um, at this point the army really in the navy. And um, it, the club was established in 1837. Uh, and obviously this bus is kind of delivered to them in 1889. Now, I think at that time, it was definitely a male only club in terms of membership. But what I don't know is whether some women would have been allowed into particular spaces inside the club. They wouldn't have been given free reign of the club, but often there was sort of a parlor where a, a woman as a guest might have been kind of allowed to, to, um, to enter. But what we do know, I think, is that, well, I, I'm pretty sure that the, the bust was originally in the, in the hall, the grand kind of entrance space of the army Navy club. So it may have been seen very occasionally by a woman who was sort of allowed to come in, <laughs> maybe go into the parlor, perhaps. But but it's it's true that it was it was essentially a male only space um, for all in, really um, to all intents and purposes. And uh, and I'm not sure it would be really interesting to see the inventory, if it exists, of the other kind of art that was in the space at that time, because I wonder if there were any other depictions of women in the space either, or if it was kind of quite male. I mean, you know, it's the Army and Navy Club, so I imagine there will have been portraits of generals, um, military kind of heroes, you know, there would have been kind of a lot of that in, in the club, um, but it, it would be fascinating to know if there were any other women depicted in the 
Elizabeth's face, or if, if it is just um, Queen Victoria, and if she's the, she was the sole woman. But but it's interesting. Um, it's a good question because I think very few women would have seen it. And in fact, the the bust remained in the club until it was sold at auction in twenty. 16 or 2017 so it, it, it spent its entire life really up until um, it was sold at auction and then subsequently acquired by the Fitzwilliam it did spend all of its life in that one space in the army and navy club and I suppose there's another interesting question is um, the depictions of men that it may have been surrounded by were they also realistic and <laughs> yes. or were they idealized hero figures yes well I'm sure there was an awful lot of kind of idealized um depictions going on um in there in different ways absolutely but it, it would be um it would be really interesting to learn what it was kind of shown next to yeah what, what were the kind of portraits around it you know what, what would it have kind of looked like? i think towards the end of its life it was actually much more discreetly shown on a kind of upstairs landing so i think as time went on queen victoria was actually kind of moved slightly out out of the way but when it was delivered it was in the grand entry Okay, uh, I've got one final question um, and then we'll, we'll wrap up, but thank you so much um, for this. Uh, the last question is definitely for Liz, because uh, why were there hippos and rhinos in Cambridge? <laughs> <laughs> why were they? For well, Cambridge, yeah. So these, these, gosh, so these are about this um, rhinos garland with the hippos were about 125,000 years ago. So um, geologically, that's pretty young, really. We normally deal in millions. Um, but what these were, so this is, that sort of period was the Ice Age. Um, and as you know, much of Britain at times was completely covered in ice. Um, but what's not always obvious is actually during the sort of the thousands and thousands of years of the Ice Age, it came and went. So there were warm periods and cold periods. And it may indeed be that we're in a warm period of that still. Um, and during this warm period 125 million years ago, obviously there were you know, no humans around at that time, the bones that we find tell us that there was a really rich flora and fauna of rhinos, hippo, elephant, lion, um, lots of deer, um, I think a few little mice, hyena, um, and then also we also find the pollen preserved in the rocks as well, which tells us that there was sort of woodlands and open grass fans. Um, all sort of on the banks of the river that has since become the Cam. Um, so the climate was clearly warmer than it is now, but it also, this, the, the rhino that we have is a species that can actually survive quite cooler climates too. Um, so it's, you know, it's quite sort of, it, it, it sort of would live alongside the woolly rhinos as well, which are the, uh, the real cold ones. Um, so what it's telling us is, is this sort of picture of actually what Cambridgeshire looked like. Um, 120, 125,000 years ago, um, which I think is, there's a, there's, we've got a lovely picture of it in the museum, it's an artist's reconstruction by a guy called Bob Nichols, um, and it really does look lovely, but nothing completely unrecognisable. Um, so hopefully it sort of, you know, it sort of sparks your imagination about actually what, um, what we see now is not what it was. Thank you, I think that answers, <laughs> answers that brilliantly. Um, so I think this is now time to wrap up. You have been absolutely wonderful to have on. Um, I don't know if you've got any closing thoughts or uh, remarks to say. Just to say, I'm really looking forward to, to seeing the, um, see what, what's sent in. I'm really, really excited to see what, what people do with all of the objects. Me too. Yeah, me too. It's been a pleasure. I have to say I'm quite excited about Queen Victoria now. I might go and have a think about why I might remake. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it has been a pleasure and we are really looking forward and excited to hearing and seeing what people think and gosh I'm you know I'm always happy to answer more questions if people have got particular things that they'd like to know or sort of I'd like to try out you know really keen to hear that. Well on that note um, if anyone has any further questions for Liz or Helen please put them in the comments and we'll try and get them passed along. Um, if you'd like to get involved with Remix please go to the website and um, check it out the challenge the first challenge ends at midnight 14th of July, but there are going to be more challenges coming over the next few weeks and months. So there is still tons of time to get involved. Thank you so much, guys. This has been Thank so you. much fun. Thanks, George. Thank you. So take care and goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye. And -bye. Bye. Um, thanks to everyone for watching. Yes, very much so.